Welcome to Data Demystified. I'm Jeff Gallick, and I'm on a mission to equip you with the information you need to thrive in our data-rich world. If you've ever seen a news story about a scientific study, you've probably heard something like statistically significant results. More likely than not, what this is referring to is a scientific study that found something like p is less than 0.05. In this video, I'm going to do two things. First, I'm going to explain what it means when someone says something like statistically significant result. Then I'll give you an intuitive explanation of what those p-values are. And finally, if you stick around to the end of this video, I'm going to explain why we use a threshold of 0.05 and not say 0.04 or 0.08 or 0.15 or anything else when determining statistical significance. So let's start with what statistical significance is. In the scientific world, a key idea is that we can never prove something to be true. That seems like a pretty strange thing to say since it sure seems like all that science is concerned with is proving things. The earth is round, the sky is blue, gravity attracts objects together. It sure seems like those are all proven to be true, and yet they're actually not. Instead, what science does is provide evidence that something isn't true. This is a pretty subtle distinction, but it's basically the whole point of statistical significance testing. So let's unpack it. Most likely, you believe that if I drop this ball, it will fall to the ground. I bet you're willing to go a step further and say that, assuming I don't do anything to trick you, this is always going to be true. In other words, no matter what, when I drop this ball, it'll fall to the ground. The problem, though, is that we can't ever test that last idea, that this will always happen. Always is a pretty long time, and to show that something always happens, you need to observe an outcome in every single possible condition that could exist across all of time. You really can't prove to me that 100 years from now this ball will still fall down when I drop it. I mean, it probably will, but you can't prove it. Instead, let's see what you can do. You can think about the opposite case and make the prediction that if I drop this ball, it will not fall to the ground. So when I do drop it and it falls, we just provided evidence against the idea that a drop ball always stays in place. And we can repeat this a bunch of times if we want to provide even more evidence against the idea that the dropped balls always stay in place. No surprise, the ball keeps dropping and the evidence against the idea that a drop ball always stays in place keeps mounting. At some point, we feel pretty confident saying that we reject the idea that a drop ball always stays in place. Note that we didn't prove that a drop ball always falls to the ground. That we can't do. Instead, we can disprove the idea that a drop ball always stays in place, which sure seems like me saying that a drop ball always falls down, but that's not the case. We don't have evidence to prove that drop balls always fall down. We've only observed that a few times, and who knows what will change in the future. So what does this have to do with statistical significance? Well, before we get into that, if you like what you're seeing, please take a moment to like this video, subscribe to this channel, and click that little bell icon so that you don't miss out on any new content that I put out. With that said, let's figure out what this all has to do with statistical significance. When I say that something is statistically significant, I'm comparing the result of some kind of analysis to what is called a null hypothesis. A good analogy to help understand what a null hypothesis is, is a jury looking to convict a defendant or not. Our legal system uses the idea of innocence until proven guilty, with statistics that innocence is the null hypothesis. It's the idea we assume to be true until evidence is presented to show us that it's not. For a jury, that evidence might be DNA at the scene of a crime or eyewitness testimony. With enough evidence, the jury rejects the idea of innocence. For statistics, think of our ball dropping example. If you know nothing about how the world works and make a prediction that dropped balls never fall, that would be your null hypothesis. And when you see that the ball really does drop, that would be the evidence you use to reject that null hypothesis and conclude that drop balls don't always stay in place. If we're testing if a drug is effective at reducing heart disease, our null hypothesis is that the drug is not effective. If after conducting a randomized experiment, something I talk about in detail in a different video that I'll link to below, we find that the drug reduces heart disease by some meaningful amount, we can reject the null hypothesis that the drug is not effective. Note that we haven't proven that the drug is effective because we haven't tested it in every single conceivable case, just in our single experiment. Instead, we've provided evidence to reject the null hypothesis that the drug is not effective. The more experiments we run that show that the drug is effective at reducing heart disease, the more our confidence grows. We can never get to the point where we are certain that the drug reduces heart disease, but we can get close enough where practically we can start prescribing the drug. So when you see something reporting a statistically significant result, what they really mean is that there was enough evidence provided to reject a null hypothesis. But how much evidence do you need to do that? That's where that p is less than 0.05 comes in. I'm not going to get deep into the statistical distributions of all this. Instead, I'm going to provide the intuition for what p is less than 0.05 means. 
First, 0.05 is a cutoff. It's something we compare a statistical result to to determine if we have what is typically called a statistically significant result. Without getting into the weeds on different statistical tests, whenever you conduct one, there is a corresponding p-value. The smaller the p-value, the greater confidence you have in rejecting whatever the null hypothesis is. So let's say we are comparing the efficacy of that heart disease drug from before to a control group that didn't get the drug, and we found that fewer people suffered from heart disease after taking the drug compared to those who didn't take it. We might find a relatively small difference between these two groups and get a p-value for that comparison of 0.60, which is well above our cutoff of 0.05. That would mean that the difference in heart disease across our two groups was so small that we don't have enough confidence to reject the null hypothesis that the drug doesn't work. In another case, we might see a large difference in heart disease across the two groups and get a p-value of, say, 0.01, which is less than 0.05, so we say that we do have enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis that the drug doesn't work. In that case, we start to build confidence that the drug is effective. Getting a bit more precise, though, that p-value has a very specific meaning. Let's take the case from before of a p-value of 0.01. This means that if the null hypothesis were true, if the drug really doesn't work at all, the chances of us getting the result that we did, or one even stronger, is only 1%. In other words, given what we observed, the much more likely case is that the null hypothesis is actually false. It would be incredibly unusual for us to find this result if the drug really didn't work at all. On the other hand, if our p-value from that drug trial was that higher value of 0.60, that means that if our null hypothesis were true, the chance of us getting the result that we did is a whopping 60%. In other words, it's very likely that the null hypothesis is, in fact, true, because we'd expect to see this result 60% of the time, even when the drug does nothing at all. So as p-values get smaller, we increase our confidence in rejecting the null hypothesis. Bringing back that p is less than 0.05 idea, basically that says that the convention that many scientific disciplines follow is that to have enough evidence to reject a null hypothesis, your result needs to be no more than 5% unlikely if the null hypothesis is actually true. Any more than that, and we say we don't have enough evidence to reject an all hypothesis. And any less than that, and we say we do. Which brings us to the final point. Why 0.05? As in, why is the cutoff for whether something is statistically significant or not 0.05? Why not 0.20 or 0.01? The answer is actually simple. It's totally arbitrary. Someone at some point in history, probably a man named Ronald Fisher back in the early 20th century, decided that 5% was the value. And we've stuck with it ever since. There's really no good reason for 5% to be the cutoff for statistical significance. It's just a convention. If you want to be sure that your evidence is very strong in its ability to reject a null hypothesis, pick a smaller cutoff like 0.01. If you don't care as much about strong evidence, pick a higher value like 0.15. It actually doesn't matter. There's no right answer. 0.05 as a cutoff is just a convention we all agree to use, but it doesn't make it right. In fact, there are plenty of people who argue that we should throw away this whole idea of statistical significance testing and instead focus on things like confidence intervals, Bayesian estimates, and effect sizes. In some ways, those people are right. On the other hand, conventions help us have a common language about things like evidence. When we have a shared language about science, we can communicate better, and that allows knowledge to grow. To be fair, I glossed over a lot here, like how to calculate those p-values, how to deal with different distributions, and how p-values are related to, but not quite the same thing as false positive rates. I did this so we can stick to the heart of the intuition you need to understand what significance testing is. But if those are topics you find interesting and want to learn more about, please take a moment to comment below and I'll make sure to make content meant just for you, my viewers. Finally, if you like what you saw, please take a moment to like this video, subscribe to this channel, and click that little bell icon so you don't miss out on any new content I put out. Thanks for watching.